In this episode, Richard and I talk to the incredible painter, Sarah Manolescu, and we ask her all about her practice and her history with making art. Um, Sarah's going to be discussing her book as well, which is Paint in Light and Colour and Oils. Um, it's a fantastic book, well worth a read and very informative um, for painters, for plein air painters, but also for still life and figurative work. So it's well worth getting a copy and uh, Sarah will be referencing the book a lot in the podcast. All the links will be in the description below. Okay, would you mind introducing yourself for the audience, please? Of course. Um, my name is Sarah Manolescu. I'm a planner painter and I live in Surrey um, in the UK and I paint full time. Mm. Lovely. Well, we're both big fans of your work. So. Oh, thank you. I've you know, followed you for a while on Instagram and, um, and I've also been reading your book as well, which is great. So we'll come on to that. A little bit later, okay. yeah. But I think it would be good, to like, to share a little bit about your journey to becoming a full-time painter. Mm -hmm. uh, you said in your book that you've always been into art and creative. Yeah. So, how's that journey been? Uh, where did it begin, and where are you? Um, now? Okay, so becoming a professional. Painter was never really part of my plan. Um, yeah. I always did art at school, so I did GCSE and A-level. Um, and then I sort of had an intention to do an art degree, but my art teacher at A-level told me I was a bit lazy and needed to do more coursework and predicted me a C. So I thought, right, OK, maybe I won't do art then and applied to do communication studies at uni. Um, but on results day, I got an A. So that was a bit confusing. And I thought about deferring and reapplying, but I thought, do you know what? My friends are going, I just want to go. So I went to university and did communication studies, which was interesting um, and didn't really paint at all in that time. Um, and then once I finished uni, I started mucking about a bit with paint um, and actually discovered oil paint at that time. Because at A-level, I'd only worked with acrylic. And I started working with oils and loved them. Um, and I moved to Wimbledon um, with my boyfriend, who is now my husband, and discovered there was Wimbledon Art Studios down the road. Um, so I decided to bite the bullet and rent a studio space there, which I think was quite a pivotal moment for me because I started to sell my work through the open studio shows we'd have twice a year. And it gave me a bit of confidence to put myself out there. But it was still very much something I did in my spare time at that point because I had a full-time job doing something else. Um, and then I decided to drop one working day and devote that to painting, uh, which worked in theory, but in practice it didn't because it often got swallowed up with work anyway. Um, and then I had my children. So art took a real backseat then, but when I started to get back into painting after having the kids when they were small, um, I decided not to go back to my old job. And my husband said, go for it, go for painting, see what you can do. And I think we agreed I give it like two years and just see what happened. And luckily it just sort of kept growing and growing and my work developed. And as the kids got older, I had more and more time. And it's just sort of, developed organically and I'm so happy with how it all worked out really yeah great great well you seem to like one of the key things about that journey is developing style over time and you've got your style and it's you know often we can't sort of see it ourselves as painters yeah. but you've definitely got it in your visual vocabulary of it. when did you start to feel that that was coming together? 
Uh, okay, so definitely when I decided to try painting plein air. Yeah. So in the early days of my painting career, I would work from photographs and I would paint really big actually, which I don't tend to do very much anymore. So I would I would go sort of out and about, go into London, I'd take photographs, I might do a bit of watercolour sketching. Um, and then I'd come home and I'd grid up a big canvas and I'd draw it all out and then I'd work on a piece over about six to eight weeks and by the time I got to the end of it I couldn't stand looking at it I was so bored and just ugh. Um, and then I was chatting to um, an art dealer one day and he said um, you should try plein air painting and I was like don't be so ridiculous that is a stupid idea because I work on a piece for so long um and also the idea of going from being in the safe studio where's where no one's watching to being out where I've got an audience potentially was just the most terrifying idea um but after a while I couldn't I couldn't resist the temptation to try um so I gathered a few bits together and looking back like my initial kit was interesting <laughs> um and I tried it and yes, it was it was terrifying, but people were encouraging and said nice things. And I think they were just quite, you know, didn't often see people painting on the street or whatever. So yeah, um, they were enjoying it too. And I was hooked after one one session, I was like, this is how I want to work. And I'd also been so inspired by my contemporaries that were doing it too, like Hedy Joe Summers and Maria Rose and p- people are in my book you know they were doing it already and I was like I want to do that um and yeah I think that was a really pivotal moment when I first started in painting planet I would my old method was still there a bit I would work on a piece over a number of sessions and I might go out t- three four times and work on a piece and again they were bigger and even that felt stale to me after a while but as I got used to it, I could work faster. And then it became my goal to say less and less and be more confident with the way I put the paint down and just think more about the light rather than the subject. Mm. Um, but yeah, that it, it was it was kind of painting that just changed the way I work with the paint. Not quite overnight, but in a very short period of time. So it, it kind of just... It was revolutionary in that sense for you. Oh, completely. And I have that person who said, why didn't you try it to thank? Because I think yeah. if it hadn't been suggested to me, I, I may not have ever considered it. I'd still be mm. doing what I was doing back then and getting very bored. So Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting you saying that, that you would sort of work on these pieces for six to eight weeks. And I used to do that as well. And oh, really? My, yeah, my attention span is not that great you know for for doing that kind of thing and I I always had that impulse to to want to capture things quicker but I didn't think that's how you done it I thought you had to kind of labour and even though I went to art college they don't really teach painting anymore as you probably know Um, so I kind of had to work it out myself but I see in your work this this kind of there's something unresolved about it. And that's, I think, what makes great sort of impressionist plein air painting. Yeah. That it's that, that thing where you, you let the viewer um, do some of the work, but, mm-hmm. but you are capturing. And let me just get my phone because I've, I've written down a few things from your book. Okay. That I'll ask you about. Um, mm-hmm. so, so it's really, right. So this point, and we'll talk about this point. So, um, it says, uh, realise the importance of painting the atmosphere over the subject. Mm-hmm. So this is really, really interesting because, and you said something about the light there as well, don't sort of paint things, you know, paint the light or look at the light. Do you find in that sense when you're looking at the scene, the more you paint, the more you're able to kind of harvest that atmosphere or those atmospheric qualities from the scene? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Um, I would get very, initially, when I first started playing to plan it was very much 
the sort of physical things in front of me. Mm. But the way I like to think of it is rather than looking at a scene, you're looking through it. And that's what yeah. I try and capture with the paint. Um, so, yeah, I'm thinking about shapes and colour mm. rather than, yeah. Like, like, I don't like to draw something out first with the brush. I'll yeah. just go in yeah. and put, put, like, planes of colour down and then work into it again. And, I mean, it doesn't always work, you know, quite a lot of the time. I'll get very frustrated and end up wiping something because it's just like, what? I hate it. Um, but when it does work, it's the best feeling. Yes. And to go home with something that I'm really happy with is just, it's just the end goal. But, you know, it's nice that sometimes it doesn't work out because it feels even better when it does. Yeah, absolutely. And it's that, I mean, it's all collective, isn't it? Whether it's a successful or failure. It's it's yeah. the whole process, and you know, every now and then the stars align, and something comes out, and you're like, "Wow!" And that's yeah. kind of the the fruit of the process in that sense. Um, so, do, do you paint every day? Um, I wish I did. It. I think I, I'm one of these people that goes in fits and starts. Um, I haven't had much chance to paint recently because the books come out and been packing up books and things like that um but over the summer early part the early part of the summer I had a very intense period where I was painting most days and just couldn't get enough but I don't think I could sustain that throughout the year um I certainly start to get if I go a while without painting and I I I start to get a bit itchy and feel the need and then I'm literally looking for anything if I can't go out, I'll find something at home that I want to paint just to sort of scratch that itch a bit. Um, but yeah, definitely more more fits and starts than daily activity. Yes. And that, that works for me. I'm, I'm sure it doesn't work for everybody. I don't know what your... Yeah, your well, it's sort of all over the place. I mean, I've had an open studio recently and had to do loads of framing for other things, so I haven't been painting as much. Yeah. I'm more comfortable with that now. I think like when I was sort of learning in that sense, I felt like I had to be doing it all of the time. Yeah. And, you know, there was that big frustration when I wasn't doing it. Um, we had Erin, I know you know Erin Spencer, so yeah, on the podcast, and she, she was saying about, you know, how she sort of finds those little windows of time amongst life and... I think, you know, every artist adapts in that sense. Um, As long as you know you can get back to it at some point. Yeah. Things are good. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, a break doesn't scare me as much as it used to. Yeah. I I, I suppose I'm always rusty when I go back to it after a bit of a break, but it it Mm. comes back quite quick. And I'm always thinking about painting even when I'm not doing it. Yeah. So. Yeah. You said, you said that in your book as well. And um, it's something where you you are constantly. Someone someone came to see me yesterday. It was open studio, and I was kind of looking out the window and stuff. And I said, "I'm still painting now. Mm-hmm. Everything, the lights, the clouds. Yeah. You're kind of always on the job in that sense, and Absolutely. it yeah. sort of all, all feeds in. And it's not time just that the easel. It's about how you see things and how you yeah. sort of absorb those. Definitely, and I totally agree with you. Yeah. Simon, do you have a question? Oh, I have tons of questions. Um, <laughs> what we were just talking about, I suppose, to tag on to what we were just saying, the fact that you are a mother as well, does this become something? Have you ever tried a, any kind of schedule where you think the children need this time and this has a window of opportunity here, but there's family time and there's social time and how the, yeah. How have, you that? how have you have you ever tried to structure anything, or is it just grabbing? Well, it, it's, it's probably not even anything I've sort of consciously done. But I suppose when the kids get home from school, I like to be here. I mean, they're they're older now, so my daughter's going to be fifteen in December. My son is thirteen, so they get themselves to school. They come home. They don't need me to be here when they walk in the door. But I'm very conscious that they're not going to be around for that much longer before they go off to university and stuff and time is so precious so the fact that I can rework my day to make sure I am here is brilliant um 
so I tend to be here when they go to school in the morning and then try to be here when they get back but then I can disappear off and paint a sunset once they've got home from school because they've seen me and I've you know chatted to them about their day um so it, it works really well and it has worked really well it was like the ideal job to have when they were small because I could set up alongside them and paint in their playroom and it, as I got more time as they went off to nursery and then to school I just sort of clawed a bit back but it was never I don't I don't really remember a time feeling really frustrated that I couldn't do it because there was always a little window here or there um and like I said I know now you know another three or four years and they won't be here at all probably which makes me quite sad and that's when I really will have all the time in the world but I feel like I get enough achieved around them to satisfy my needs and yeah it's that yeah it does I mean you do mention in your book about how oil painting and a children's playroom isn't necessarily well suited to sit together. Is there anything you can tell us about the time when that was something you were discovering or the time when yeah. you were wrestling with that that kind of yes. that interaction? Um, I remember, and this was back in the days when I was doing big painting. So I had a big painting on the easel and my palette of colors was out and I was painting this pristine beach, really, really pale sand, big expanse. And I was like, oh, just going to nip to the loo. Kids were on the floor playing. I was like, they're not going to go anywhere near it. They're busy with their stuff. They're not interested in what I'm doing. So I was gone for three minutes, something like that. And I came back in and my son, who at the time must have been, I don't know, 18 months, had climbed up onto my chair, got a paintbrush, stuck it in some cerulean blue oh. on the pristine beach. And I was just like... <laughs> <laughs> managed to get it off and I was like I actually quite like the fact that he did that because obviously he has been clocking what I'm doing and he's seen mm. me with my brush and yeah. he's thinking yeah I'd like to have a go at that um but other than that I think they 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 knew what the boundaries were and they were quite happy to just have me in the room with them mm. so they needed me I was there um and as they've got older like in lockdown when they were at home all the time and when I was trying to think of things for them to do beyond their schoolwork, uh, you know, we did go into the studio a few times and we'd set up a still life and they paint alongside me. Mm. So they have sort of been involved, but their level of interest in what I do is pretty minimal. They're just like, Oh yeah, I'm on. Pay. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. Isn't it? That it's just sort of a job. Yeah. In their totally. life, what you do. Yeah. Yeah. And, they become as well, and again, I've made some notes from your book. It's a great bit about painting figures in there and getting your sister, your daughter, sorry, to, to sit and yeah. she can scroll for as long as she wants, which is a bonus. Yeah. But, but you're, pain, you're painting that. Um, mm. We talked to uh, Tushar Sabale on the, on the podcast and yeah. we were talking a lot about his family and his, his daughters and he paints them a lot and sort of captures these moments in time that, you know, photographs don't just don't do the same. Yeah. Um, you know, do, do you f find yourself doing that? Is it a kind of a say like Bonar and Voya that they capture these sort of, in, you know, the internal life of the family? Do you yeah, I, I do. I mean, in the book, you'll see that there was obviously the series I did where they were all sat mm. under the spotlight. Yeah. Um, and I became totally obsessed with that because the light was so good and mm. just trying to push myself a little bit further with everyone I did. Um, but other than that, sometimes they'll be doing something and I'll be like, oh, could you, could you just? And they're like, oh, okay. And uh, sometimes I offer a bit of money, like sit for me for a bit. And uh, sometimes they're keen, sometimes they're not. Um, interestingly, Lola went through a phase of being an excellent muse, my daughter, um, for me. But I think she's got a bit bored of it now. And Stanley sort of stepped up and he's more patient and will sit. Um, and I think it's really nice. It's like almost like a 
a diary of home life, like you said, like a little. Um, they they are more for me than for anyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I have sold a few of them, and what I find interesting about that is obviously it resonates, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, my daughter can become someone else's daughter because mm-hmm. they're so loose. I mean, it could be anybody, yeah. and they just like that feeling of intimacy and home and yeah I think it speaks to people there's there's a real warmth in them as well and again so when you're discussing uh, figures um, you're talking as well about the the less you try to say the better so it's this kind of thing of capturing again that that atmosphere yeah something like that and to focus on painting the light rather than the figure as well, mm-hmm. which is so important for, for figurative painting because yeah. it's, it's extremely difficult to do and it's extremely daunting to, to start. So yeah. they're really, really good tips. Do, do you want to talk a little bit about figurative painting and you know, <laughs> how you feel about it, your approach? Yeah, well, I, it, it's definitely more about the figure for me than achieving a likeness. I think my aim is mm-hmm. to achieve a likeness through the physicality. Um, mm-hmm. I think I do mention it in the book, you know, how someone holds themselves. It's very unique to them. So while I may most of the time pretty much ignore the face, I'm not going for features, um, just the way they sit yeah. is so much them. Um, I did a painting of my husband uh we were in Greece on holiday and th- there's no facial features there whatsoever, but it's him. And it's, it is about, it's just observing what, what rather than tr- spending ages trying to observe the face and replicate that I'm observing the way the light hits, um, the color of his skin, uh, just the way he arranges himself. And then mm. that person comes through Um yeah, so it's when when I approach a figure painting, I just I start by just making a mark of something, and then I just build it up, and I might wipe a bit of away and tweak and things like that. But I'm constantly just thinking about what's that color there, how is the light affecting that bit, how does it compare to the bit next to it, and it's almost like a puzzle. I'm just piecing it together. Yeah, yeah. and, and then, you're working like holistically in that sense so you're you're constantly adjusting it yeah yeah Yeah, I think I think my main aim in the very early stages is to try and get paint all over the board not necessarily cover it completely because I like to leave bits of the primer showing through Mm. I think it's sort of part of the sort of signature style of my work I guess um and then just I don't like once I put paint down, I don't like to mess with it too much. But if it's not saying what I want it to say, I will add a bit more or tweak or whatever. Um, and what I found quite interesting. So for some of the step by steps in the book. Obviously. I'm painting as I go, I can't make notes and paint at the same time. So I would just start recording on my phone and just talk, talk through what I was doing. And it was really interesting listening to it back, seeing how my brain is literally going from one place to the, like all over. Not, mm. And is that because my attention span is so small that I get bored of working on that bit? But actually, I think that's the key to a successful painting. Um, I think I was definitely guilty in the early days of fixating on one part of a painting and working until that was done. And then I'd look at the rest of it and it was so unfinished. And then when I tried to do that everywhere else it just didn't come together I think it's so important to work on the whole board at once and I also step back all the time um I I can't sit to paint because I wouldn't get up I have to stand and I'm constantly stepping back to look um and if I haven't got the room to step back I will get my phone and look through the camera to see it quick cheat um so I can just assess how it's coming together um and a lot of people have said to me over the years or more recently that when they look up close at my work it's just all blobs and a mess and it's only when they step back that it makes sense and that's probably because 
I step back so much when I'm working. Yeah. And yeah. That's fascinating what you're saying. And I think like you're saying about working on different bits and, and I was teaching on the weekend and I was trying to show that thing that if I make a mark here, I'll go flipped over here. So say if it's the sea, I put a mark in the sea, I'll jump over to a cloud here. And yeah. it does look like my attention span is there, but I was trying to explain that you know every mark you're making is relating to the others, and especially when it comes to tone, colour, yeah. things like that. So you're working all over it. And when I've done workshops and painted still lifes before, I always say, don't spend ages on the vessel, on the vase, because I've done it before and gone round like half an hour later and people are perfecting this vase <laughs> and the rest of it's not being done. So look, a bit there, a bit there. And then like a jigsaw puzzle, you, you're putting it together and it takes that view. Do you yeah. think that comes with time and experience? Yes, I think so, definitely. Um, like I said, I, I, I used to be guilty of just honing in on one bit. And yeah. then I think then there's a risk of overworking because you take one area so far you then have to do the same with the other areas to make it work Mm -hmm. together and I've killed so many paintings that way Mm -hmm. um yeah so I mean it still happens sometimes now but that's that is the beauty of oil paint if in the early stages I sort of know if a painting is going to work or not and if it gets to a certain point I'm like "Mm -mm." I just wipe it away and start again because I'd much rather take home an empty board than a painting that makes me cross. So, um, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Simon? Yeah, this brings up something I wanted to ask you about, really, because making art has a lot to do with filtering your vision and how you can remove the detail initially so that you can see certain layers that you need to build up. And is that something which you have intuit now or is it something which you still have epiphanies about when you go out is it because it can be such a revelation at times especially you talk about the different seasons and how that can inform Mm -hmm. the palette so Mm -hmm. how is it that you've learned to reduce some of the contrast in early stages in order to build up and and achieve the, the the finish that you're known to have in your paintings how's that come about really um I think when I'm quite familiar with the subject, um, that comes more easily. Like I, I talk about in the book, the importance of having a place that you return to, particularly when you're painting the seasons and, um, you know, to go to a place and paint it again and again and again. You learn to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, when you, like, you just condense the information and it's much easier to do that when you've done it before. Um, and then sometimes, say for example, I've I've been doing a lot of landscape painting, which is obviously a very organic, loose sort of thing. And I I can sort of tweak it so it's not exactly as I see it, but what suits the painting. If I then go into London and I'm painting structure and everything's totally different, that can, that can take a while to adjust to. Um, so I always sort of, allow myself that time when I've gone somewhere new, or even if I've um, gone to a country I've never been to before and the light is different, you have to allow your, yourself that time to visually adjust and also develop your shorthand. That's what I want to say, the shorthand for for that sort of scene. Um, and I think that's why in the book, I wanted to develop a palette of colors for every season because I do think with season change as well, like for example, if I've towards the end of spring or something, not done much painting and then summer comes along and everything suddenly bursts into color, you know, there's greens everywhere, it just goes mad. If I haven't been out painting in that early change, when I first go and paint summer as it's come in, it doesn't work because my brain hasn't switched into that mode. It's still thinking spring colors. And that that often happens to me. So I suppose t- to to help people along, I produce those palettes for each season, just as a, also as a reminder. Like, well, 
it, the seasons change, so we need to think differently now. So these are the colours we're going to be thinking about because they're going to be there in the landscape. You just look and you'll find them. But they're not a hard and fast rule. They're just a, a starting off point. And I mean, I find with mixing colours, I don't really have a... I mean, I, ha I, I know my palette and I know what works and what doesn't, but there's no one way to get to a certain colour. And I will often just keep adding stuff until I get what I want and then yeah. then I slap it on. But yeah, um, yeah I think it's, we, we as artists can be extremely tough on ourselves and very critical. We are our own biggest critic. I know I am mine. And I think we need to sometimes go, do you know what? It's okay. There's no rush. Just take your time. Just allow yourself to just look, take it all in. And if it doesn't work the first time, you have another go and you'll get there. You know, it's just yeah. need to be kind to ourselves. I have a friend who's she's a landscape painter and she does incredibly um, well rendered environments. So she really, you know, renders everything into infinity, really. And I tell her that I'm a lot looser with my approach and she wants to render reality and I want to have artistic license. So we have a discussion about where you make those decisions. Yeah. And I've mentioned before that, you know, I can look at certain scenes and pine trees will be too deep a green for everything else. It just doesn't sit as well as the other greens. It's just really uh, a different, a different kind of tone, I suppose, than everything else is uh, balancing out with each other. And that's something which again is, it's going to be individual, I suppose, at how you choose colors. Are you comfortable changing colors on the landscape to say, for example, my brother says, why would you paint a sky blue when you can paint it violet? And no one will notice because it will be more interesting sometimes for the environment and it will describe something tonally similar, but environmentally more rich at times. Is that something mm. you've, you've played with as well that you are comfortable doing? Um, Not that specifically yeah. the sky, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, to a point, I'm I'm definitely one who is true to what's there. So mm. I wouldn't put clouds in if they weren't there and mm. I will choose my subject depending on what the weather's doing so for example if it's a clear blue sky with not a cloud in sight I do not want to go and paint a landscape because well I actually I would but it wouldn't be about the sky it would be horizon line really high up if mm. you know if there's a horizon line at all it might just be about the landscape um and or I would go to a city where good light would make everything sing or I'd go to the beach and paint figures um a really good sky with amazing clouds is what I want if I'm going to go and paint a landscape mm -hmm. because I love that to drama. yeah and the conversation that happens between the landscape yeah. and the sky love that mm -hmm. so what do you how do you deal with um clouds I mean you paint clouds beautifully how do, so when you get to a scene, because obviously on a cloudy day, especially if it's windy as well, they're not sticking around to be painted. Yeah. <laughs> they're moving yeah. very quickly. How, how do you do it? Do you do it based on your first impression or do you sort of go along with it to a certain extent? I think I go along with it. Yeah. Um, but I've always got composition in mind as well. Yes. And if anything's going to get wiped and redone, it's a cloud. Yeah. So I, there's no, I think this is part of the reason why I don't teach because I don't really have a formula. Um, I'm just reacting to what is in front of me. Mm -hmm. And with clouds, it's, I'm looking at the colours in the clouds because I think when I first started painting clouds, I was like, well, they're just white and they're grey, aren't they? <laughs> And um, it took me a lot of looking and playing with palette and stuff to realise, actually, no, there's a hell of a lot of colour going in there. And there's very little white, in fact. Um, and now it's like one of my favourite favorite things to paint. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's just, it is an impression. But, yeah, it's also true to the subject. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, if I started a sky that had lots of, clouds in and then it started clearing back I'd probably be inclined to stop and right abandon because I I need that visual information I can't 
Mm. I'm not one of these artists that can just pluck it out of my head and make it up. Mm. So you are ob observational. That's, that's a, but like you were saying with the, the composition, that it's so important, and I, I notice as well, um, and this is it. So I work a lot from my head, but, uh, but it's based on a lot of observation. Yeah. Um, and I notice in your book that you do, and I think it's the sunset that you're painting, um, it's like a beach scene with a bit of headland coming in, and you just do a basic lines for where things are going to be. Yeah. I tend to do the same, so I'll go out and walk for miles. I don't tend to paint plein air, but I will make loads of thumbnail sketches of just yeah. the composition, and they're just lines, you know, horizon here, headland there, and and then sort of make colour notes as well, but then just go wild with it. Yeah, yeah. That framework, that compositional framework, how important do you think that is to underpinning what you're doing? Um, well, I think a composition can really make or break a painting. I think the yeah. painting can be good, but if the composition doesn't work, it's it's going in the naughty corner and it's not coming back. Yeah. Um, and I think after years of sort of painting, it becomes intuitive. And it's not even a conscious thing working out what's going to work compositionally. I still get it wrong, hence the wiping. Um, but I'm also finding recently I want to sort of push myself to try compositions because I think we're also in danger of repeating ourselves if we just, Absolutely. you know, also if you go into the same place all the time, like I like to go to um, the same places, you sort of just do the same thing in a slightly different way. And I think it's important to try and shake it up a bit and say to yourself, well, I'm not going to paint that like that today. I'm going to try something different, do it at a slightly different angle or, you know, sit on the floor or something looking at a different way or something like that just to 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 vary it a bit. Yeah, and to, to push yourself. Yeah. Um, interesting you're saying about that, the place. Where is it? It's, it's Farping Hill, is that what it's called? It's where the Trundle, you... which is... Um, a Goodwood race course in right. Sussex so what I like about that spot is you can it, it I love to do a sort of macro landscape where I'm up high mm. um and I think that's a great way to observe the seasons as well mm. and from up there oh, I love it because basically the sun tracks all the way around and if I get there in sort of late afternoon depends on the time of year but if the sun is sort of over the water by the Isle of Wight, which I can see, it, it the light is just incredible. And it's that sort of liquid light that I love to try and capture. Um, so that's a big pull. That That's why I always like to go to that spot. Um, but it's just, it's nice to go somewhere where you feel comfortable. Yes. And it's familiar. Yeah. And on a day where I don't want lots of people walking past and stopping mm. to chat and things, it's a great place to go because you get the odd cyclist or walker or whatever, but yeah. essentially it's just me and the landscape. And you get to know it so well. Um, I've got outside my studio, here's the Tidal River. It's oh, the wow. Grey Twos in, in Norfolk. Yeah. And um, just being in tune with it and, and west facing, so I get the sunset out of here. Oh, but wow. This morning was um, a huge tide sort of coinciding with the recent harvest moon and um i sort of knew it was coming like about a week ago from being in tune just with how things are and in tune with nature and i think we talked to rod major about this as well about the tuning into the landscape and becoming familiar with it and like you with the seasons and your familiar places you notice those nuances. You become part of it in a way. And yeah, absolutely. Things that you know you didn't notice before because you go there so so frequently and paint. Yeah. You know it in, in such a different way. It's very magical. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. can't can't beat it. Um, I was up there just the other day actually, and it was Storm Agnes was coming. Right. But I don't think where we are it quite hit us. But it was pretty windy up there. 
I was just like this, this. I don't care what the painting's like. Actually, I just, yeah. I just love being up here, and I was being battered by the wind, and mm. it's just so, it's just so exciting to be out there and part of it, and yeah, just yeah. magic. And and to sort of paint it like over and over again, but it's that sort of sense, that familiarity with it, and then um, Leon Kossoff. Who, um, a London painted Frank Auerbach's uh, contemporary. He just painted this cherry tree in his garden. Yeah. Uh, sort of over and over. Just that intimacy with the subject, I find so, so exactly. beautiful. It's the intimacy. Yeah. He's yeah. so familiar with the subject. Can't yeah. Beat it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Simon? I always feel like it takes a lot of confidence for a painter to leave a, a big, bold mark on the painting instead of brushing something in. That must be something which is, well, used to be scary for you, because obviously you, I mean, you've produced such amazing, powerful work that way. And I do love how you capture light and atmosphere and the energy of the, the environment. But is there, I mean, are there, are there times when that goes wrong and you found a fix for it? Because a lot of the time being a professional artist means knowing how to fix things when something goes awry. So yeah. how have you found there's fixes for things like that um well if i avoid small brushes that helps mm. um i i find i try to do well i think my art teacher was quite right in that he told me i was a bit lazy because i'm not very good at changing my brushes over so i'll pick a brush and i'll start and it's normally quite a big one um and then I'll try and do as much as I possibly can with that brush because I don't want to change it. I don't even, I just swish it out in my Terps pot, give it a wipe and mix the next colour. So sometimes that makes my colours a bit sort of dirty, but that's just my process, I guess. Um, and then I try and avoid anything teeny tiny. And yeah, just if I can do it all with one brush, I will. Um, and if something goes wrong and it feels too tight I just wipe it away and have another go mm, it, nice. I mean I think I used to get really upset with um failed paintings or you know if I'd gone so far with it and it wasn't working I'd be like oh I, don't, I spent all that time on it already I, I don't want to wipe it but like I said before I just I would much rather take home an empty board than a painting that I don't like and sometimes wiping something away leaves something really interesting behind that I can then work with, you know, put a bit more paint on and it, it says what I wanted to say. And that actually happened. Um, there's one painting I put in the book in the, the water chapter where I'd been painting, looking out over the water and there's lovely clouds in the sky, but it needed more than just the water in the sky. It needed something. And there were some boats going past and, this one boat sail past the lovely white sail. And I said, like, oh, I'll put that in. And I put it in. I was like, oh, God, that looks awful. It's ruined it. Ooh, it's got to come out. So I wiped it away. And when I wiped away the boat, it took the paint off underneath that was for the water. And it suddenly made sense with the light. And I was like, oh, well, that's quite cool. So I left it and then just thought, oh, well, I don't want a big boat. I'll put some smaller ones in and there were some sort of around there that were further away, closer to the horizon line. I was like, yeah, that's what I need to do. And I popped them in. And then I was like, oh, that's, that's it. It's finished. I'm not going to touch it anymore. And if I hadn't had the bravery to think it hasn't worked, I'm going to get rid of it. That happy accident wouldn't have happened. Yeah. Yeah. And it was the, it made the focal point of the painting. Yeah. I, mean, and I hardly did anything. I just literally wiped something away and yeah, I, lo I love it when that happens. It doesn't, you know, sometimes I wipe things away and it's, ah, oh, I've ruined it. But <laughs> You can't yeah. plan for things like that. And that's what really helps resolve or not necessarily resolve, but helps kind of pull together certain parts of a painting that you're unhappy with. And yeah. thing which I've been learning as I go along, because I'm still educating myself in paint slowly. And it's usually too, my, my colours are too heavily saturated and it's always trying to find these shades of grey make every color complement each other as opposed to having something really bright that is too dominant over everything else yeah that's something which must be i don't know how quickly you you 
learned that or whether someone taught you that because I didn't get taught that that's something which I just discovered by comparing myself to artists like yourself and you know people who I admire and saying why can't I achieve something which has this atmosphere to it and everything just looks like I've not observed things keenly enough and I think it's those tertiary colors and and trying to understand the grayscale of everything yeah to an extent is there anything that you can share about about learning that and about working that a lot I think what advice could I give that um when it comes to grays you can really push them in in exciting directions and what I like to get overall in a painting is a balance so there's a lot of earth colors and grays in there with smaller sort of like pops of tertiary color if at all so I, I suppose my advice would be spend time really getting to know your palette and mixing your colors and working out really examining those grays because they often lean in a direction um I mean I often start if I'm mixing a gray taking a bit of burnt sienna ultramarine blue and some white and that's a pretty bog standard warm gray but it might need to go a bit more purple so then I'm adding in maybe a bit of alizarin crimson and a bit more blue um so I think it's just really keen observation and looking all over it stepping back really assessing it and before you do anything bold with your tertiary colors really assess whether it needs it or not because you can leave that out if you don't want to put it in or knock it back a bit so it's not quite so strong because you don't want something screaming to be looked at and also you only really want I don't like the phrase focal point, but you want the eye to go to a certain point. And if you've got two spots that are screaming, the eye doesn't know where to go. So you've got to think about the viewer's journey as well. And you want them to go to, well, you direct them to where you want them to go. You just... mentioned that in the book with the sheep and the trees behind as well, which is a lovely consideration of how to compose a piece and how to consider the viewer's perspective, which is... Yeah, it's really interesting. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's really great insight there. I just waffle away. I hope it's helpful. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> how I wrote the book, I just waffled for ages and there we go. So when it comes to colour um, and the palette, you said something there about knowing and understanding your palette. It's so important, isn't it? But it's yeah. because they are, I mean, that's your tools, you know, I mean, your brushes and stuff, your tools, but the colours are as well. I used to buy, um, I think like you, so I bought every tube possible. Um, I was living in London at the time and we'd go to Jackson's or to Atlantis yep. Art and Same. see all of these old Holland colours and think I've got to buy every single one. Yeah. But then I started, and I can't remember what triggered me to do it, but I just started painting with free primaries and just said, look, learn this yeah. way. Um and so I just used those and realised that, uh, you know, in a very short amount of time that I learned much more. Yeah. And because I bought all of these tubes as well, it meant that I could work with uh, different combinations of those primaries. So, for example, you know, I could use ultramarine blue, um, alizarin crimson and cadmium yellow, or then I could just use yellow ochre, burnt sienna, and Farlow Blue, so all of these combinations. But how important, you know, I mean, you mentioned it there, do you, do you think it is just to sort of really focus sometimes on just learning how to mix? You also say, uh, also say something interesting in the book about pre-mixed colours and don't, you know, you advise yeah. not to. I, th I think um, I'm talking specifically there about pre-mixing colours for sunsets and sunrises. Right. Uh, I found that sort of air temperature, like moisture levels, all of that mm. can completely affect the colours that I'm seeing. And I think the danger there with pre-mixing is you're thinking, right, it's going to be it's gonna be this. I need a, like a soft pink and I need a, mm. a purple. And, and then you're at risk of putting the colours down when you're not actually seeing them 
Mm. I know I'm lazy. I would go, near enough, I'll put it down. And I think, although it's massively time pressured to paint a sunrise or a sunset, you do have time mm. to mix and apply. And I find something, not, not all the time, but sometimes because I have to paint so quickly, my conscious brain is just off somewhere. And yeah. I'm I'm making decisions without even realizing I am. And something quite lovely can come out of it. Um so I do like to paint the sunset, but it's that it's that sweet spot, isn't it, where it's not a cheesy sunset. Mm-hmm. It's got a mm-hmm. and I think I think that again is the danger of the pre mixing thing, that it could yeah. be cheesy. Yeah. And if you if you literally spend, you know, you're looking, quick mix, colour down, mm-hmm. looking again, it's it's much more true to what you saw. Yeah. And really beautiful. And it's a, you're you're involved in the whole process, like we were talking earlier about painting holistically, that you're moving around these things. I think that if you've got everything pre-mixed in that sense, you you you're missing um, a massive part of the mm. experience. Absolutely, of, yeah. Of seeing, of absorbing, and again, when I paint sunsets, I'm tending to paint them to some extent from memory, so some of that translation of the colours being lost but um, I tend to have a, a very strong visual memory so I'll, yeah which I don't I'll, yeah right right so so I'll have I'll have them in my mind and yes they may get sort of distorted to some extent but for me it's that sort of that whole process where I will watch it out the window here okay, and it's sort of run back with this fresh in my mind and, and yeah. trying to do it and if I had, for example, laid all of the premix colours on my palette beforehand, it, it's it's sort of you're losing part of that amazing yeah. thing of being in the moment, in that flow with it, and working with your tools and that adjustment, looking, adjusting, and and that's what painting's about, isn't it? It's about absolutely sort of being in the zone, yeah, and in the moment. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I agree. When did you? When did you decide, and like you say, you, you change your palettes around a little bit depending on the season. When was it that you sort of decided and kind of honed it down? I think when I changed my setup, because when I first started painting plein air, I had a big box. It was like this big. It was the box that I'd stored my paints in in the studio, and I thought, it's okay, I can take that with me not really thinking of the practicalities and it had every colour in it and then when I started painting more with other plein air painters I saw that they had a limited palette it was much easier to carry around because even if you did take the tubes with you it was just a small bag not a massive box and I thought oh I don't know how perhaps you know if I want this particular colour what am I going to do and that I think in itself made me think well I'm sure you can get there somehow or close enough with what you've got. So, um, yeah, I think I just started developing a palette, looking at art books, seeing what other artists had on theirs. Um, I love Richard Pikesley's book, Landscape Painting. Mm. That has been very useful in terms of deciding what colours to have. Um but it is, it, I suppose it doesn't really matter what colours you have on your palette. It's unique to every single artist, but you have to spend the time getting to know them. And that I don't necessarily mean that you sit at home and you have a grid and you mix every colour and you work it out, because I I don't have the memory to retain that information anyway. So it might help me a little bit, but not completely. But it does stick if I'm out in the landscape and I'm, trying to get to a colour I want. And like I said, there might not just be one route to it, but it's that muscle memory yeah. and laying it all out the same every time and just, yeah, it becomes intuitive over time. Yeah, And like with all tools, the more you use it, the, the more you understand it. And yeah. um, it's like with musicians, you know, the colours are chords you know the more you can uh, know them the more you can string them together to make the these new things yeah um, it, just quickly about tools as well um 
you don't use hog hair brushes, you use synthetic. And yeah. you said it's because you couldn't paint in, in your style. Why is that? Um, I just find them a bit stiff. Mm. I do a lot of this when I'm when I'm putting paint down. It's not all sort of smooth, and I don't. I mean, it's, there's certain points in a painting I will load up the brush with quite a lot of paint, but particularly in the early stages, I do thin it with a bit of medium, and I'm sort of scrubbing it on. And I just, I just don't get on with them. I just find them too. I don't like the marks they make. They're, they're, like I said, they're stiff, and I go through a lot of synthetic brushes because I abuse them so much, and I'm mm. not very good at cleaning them as much as I should. Mm. Um, but they just, they just work for me. I, mm. I know every artist is different. I know artists who use hog brushes beautifully, and I wish sometimes I could use them like that but no synthetics are my are my babies i love them yeah, yeah. that's interesting um i read you put an instagram post out not long ago and you said you were doing a reintroduction of yourself and you said that um you love oil paints but like overly thick oil paint makes you feel <laughs> sick that's really yeah. interesting yeah. it's like a vis visceral thing yeah, yeah. yeah and it, it's a really fine line like mm. i do I like juicy paint, mm. but it can go a step too far mm. and then I feel nauseous and I don't understand why. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've spent a long time sort of trying to analyse it, like why do I feel this way? Mm. Um, and I I think if it's sort of put on with a brush, I'm okay with it, but it's, it's those paintings where it's like they've really scooped it up with a palette knife and it's on mm. there and it's everywhere. Yeah. I, I can't. It just makes me sick. Frank, like Al Frank Auerbach, you know that. So Auerbach when he does the heads, that. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? Because it's your, you know, that that thing with paint that it is so flexible. And you also also mentioned this why oil paint because you you can do it extremely thin. You can thin down with turps. You can have it sort of thin down technically with the glaze, you know, mm -hmm. it's sort of glossy like honey. It can be moderately thick, it could be scumbled. I really yeah. like sort of dry brush uh, scumbling. Yeah. It can be, you know, in pasta and then it can be like super in pasta. Mm -hmm. and, and it might be in a way that, you know, you love it so much in a sense, it's like a, a, a nice cake. It's very nice, but if you, you have too much of it, it makes you feel a bit sick. So it might be yeah. a bit of Actually, yeah. I think I understand what you mean now, because where I live, I'm in North Wales, and there is a Welsh School of Arts, which is exactly what you're talking about, where if in Williams. it's very heavily laid on with a trowel almost. You know, it's just it's shelves that you could rest little ornaments on. It's really yeah. heavy. It makes you think of clotted cream or something and it just kind of gives you that relation to food and I it could be wrong but for me I've had that feeling of it's a bit sickly it's a bit a bit too rich for my taste really uh, maybe that's uh, it done too heavily but I wanted to ask as well because you mentioned at the start of this interview that you had a kit that you took out that was interesting it's obviously been whittled down into something a lot more precise can you talk about what what was in the original kit and how you how you did uh, develop it? Um, well, but specifically to my plan air kit. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Um, so the very first time I went out painting plan air, um, I think I I didn't even have a field easel. It was a very simple, easily thing, mm. and my massive box of paints and a tear away palette, and some brushes but not many um can't remember what medium I would have had some medium with me but I can't remember what I used back then uh it's just all a bit cumbersome plastic bags full of stuff um and yeah slowly I think I, I, the, the next step was to get rid of the the silly easel thing and I got a they called the the, the field easels like where oh, you French. Well, the... that's it French, well, yeah, that's it yeah. oh, um yeah. And they were that was certainly more practical, um, but it obviously does have its limitations. 
and I still had the massive box of paints. So my hands were full. And the thing that I really struggled with was particularly if it was cold to try and dismantle with all the nuts and bolts and things with cold fit with numb fingers. It just, it was really actually quite painful. Um, so I thought, right, I think it's time to invest in something else. And that's when I discovered the sort of tripod poche box setup. And the first one I bought was an open box M, which served me very well um, and allowed me to work on the size of panel that I liked. But these things don't last forever. And I'd had my eye on the Edge Pro Gear paint book for a while, but it's obviously got quite a hefty price tag. But I decided a few years ago that it was, I'm, I, you know, spoil myself, why not? Um, and I love it. My my Edge Pro is it's a thing of beauty. And you no longer have the tearaway palettes as well. You mentioned the tearaway palette as well. Oh yeah, well. yeah, they went, they went. So as soon as um I guess as soon as I switched to a poche box, I didn't really need a tearaway palette anymore because the palette was there. Of course. Um I mean I did have a wooden palette with the why did I have a tearaway palette? Maybe I wasn't very good at tidying up after myself. Mm-hmm. Yes, that was it. I didn't really remember to wipe it all clean when mm. I finished. Um, so if I had a tearaway palette, I'd just rip it off and throw it away. Not very good for the environment, better what I do now. Um, yeah, so I'm not very good at cleaning my brushes, but I do always clean my palette down after, but even before I've left the site where I'm painting, because I know if I don't do it before I put my stuff away, mm. I'll get home and forget about it and it'll be dried and, and I'm going to have clean. to do it and it's going to be more difficult <laughs> absolutely yeah there's a lovely point in the book where you talk about going on a recce without all of your gear so mm. that you're not encumbered by the weight and therefore going to settle for a lesser composition due yeah. to the weight is is that something which you found from not having it at a time and then thinking i didn't go as far last time because of the weight is that literally what happened? yeah or um because i have two dogs Mm. So I walk a lot in the local area or we'll, you know, take a family dog walk and drive into Sussex and explore a different area. And I found a lot of routes that way. And I do view things differently when I don't have my, I I think you just, you just, I don't know. I suppose if I've got my kit on my back and I've gone out with the intention of painting, it's like, right, got to find somewhere, set up, get going, make use of this time. Whereas if I haven't got my kit with me, I'm just meandering and I'm taking it all in. And I think maybe I'm slightly more open to seeing stuff that I wouldn't have got that far, but also maybe just wouldn't have paid attention to. So it's tapping into a different eye if I go out without my kit. Um, So yeah, a lot lot of spots I have found from dog walking and then I think, ah, and I'll put a little pin on my phone map and go, need to go back there. And then I have to work out where's the closest place to park and how I can get there faster, but not necessarily on my feet. Um, but I also talk in the book about um, going for like a long walk with a much smaller setup and like devoting the day to it, which I think is a, is a great way of finding new compositions as well. Mm. I like that you covered in the book the consideration for others knowing where you're going and having an app which gives your location because if you're out in the wilderness painting somewhere it's safer to have something where someone can find you within a certain range of of distance is that did something happen where you thought this feels a bit sketchy or was it just something just some common sense kicked in um yeah there have been a few occasions where i felt uncomfortable Mm. um i don't know if this is because i'm female but I've I've been in a few situations where I've been I felt a bit trapped by a guy, mm. um, and just thinking, does somebody know where I am? And I suppose when I was thinking about that for the book, I was like, I think that's important to to make sure that someone does know where you're going, um, because you know you are vulnerable when you're out there, and you know not everyone is lovely, and I think. Someone might take advantage. I certainly think that's true, that people take advantage of the fact that you can't go anywhere because you're set up and you're 
painting and that that you know and that's not, not with people sort of looking to cause you harm necessarily but people know you can't go anywhere so they just talk at you yeah. and at you and at you and then you don't quite know how to get rid of them yeah. so yeah talk about that in the book too so what's yeah. the name of the app because we'll put it up so that people who are watching the video can see or see yeah it. it's called what three words three and words. Um, i think it's 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 really gained traction sort of globally but it basically it'll every three meter radius square on the planet well land masses anyway has, has got this unique three word code mm. and if you go on the app and you say where you are it'll give you the three words and then you can share that and people will be able to find you i think it's genius absolutely it's genius mm. you were saying now about the um uh, people coming and talking to you and, and engaging and um it is very interesting and you said the most sort of um the example that stands out a lot is when a, a woman picked up a brush and actually went to to actually paint on your painting how, how did you how did you deal with that um, I took the paintbrush out of her hand and I said no <laughs> and she went no and I said no <laughs> and then she went <laughs> that was that. But she took me so unawares because she sort of came up. I, she didn't speak particularly good English. Um, this is when I lived back in Wimbledon, so I, I was. I think I was on Wimbledon Village High Street, and uh, I was just engrossed in what I was doing. And she yeah. was smiling and looking. And then the next thing, the brushes. I was just like, "Whoa, <laughs> no! This is not a joint effort. This is just yeah. mine." Um, <laughs> well, how much "no" can mean "no"? No. No, <laughs> just yeah, definitely. I, 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 I'm not. It. I'm not negotiating. It's a definite no for me. Yeah. And you said it as well about the um, the people saying, "Oh, my, you know, uncle's, <laughs> you know, my cousin is is a painter too." Um, yeah. Have you got better at being sort of polite, but kind of boundaried with that over time? Yes, I think so. Um, I'm very much better at bringing a conversation to a close I used to just you know because you might get a really sweet old person who obviously hasn't talked to anyone for a long time and they know that you're there and they're talking away and I you know I want to engage with people up to a point but I'm there to work I'm not yeah. you know I'm not there to make conversation um but uh, yeah I just avoiding eye contact and yeah Getting very sort of monosyllabic and mm, 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 <laughs> work quite well, yeah. And I feel bad, but like I said, I've got I've got mm. stuff to do. And also, if I'm, you know, if you're really in the flow of it, you don't want you don't want no. the interruption. You just want to absolutely. Stay you I've to, if I'm out and I'm I'm haven't got my bouchard and stuff, I'm just doing sketching. I was because people still come in, come and talk to you then. And but I was I was say, oh, looks like the light is changing. I better crack on. You know that kind of thing, and yeah, hopefully they take take the hints with it. But yeah, not always. No, some some people are really stubborn, mm. and uh, they want to finish the conversation when they're ready to finish it, and yeah, harder uh, ones to get rid of. Yeah, um, you said about that you don't teach, you don't do workshops um, or anything like that. Um, and is that because you? Like you were saying, it's very hard to teach how to react to what you're seeing. Um, yeah. And because it's not technical in a way, is it? It's it's a way of seeing and perceiving. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can often teach, and I teach a few times a week and do workshops and stuff. I could I always show how to start a painting, mm -hmm. but people want to know how to finish it. And I said, but you can't teach that. No, that's that, really good point. Yeah, that's, that's what you've got to got to learn yourself. You know, it's people often find it. Say if they see a still life or a scene, um, they often don't know how to start because it looks too complicated. So I said, look, let's simplify it. Let's just start with the basics and work. But then there's a point where you, you have to go your own way and resolve those, and they, that can only be done through practice and, uh, and time. Um, yeah. So in relation to teaching and to the book as well, 
I mean, you, you're sort of teaching in the book that yeah. again, you're, you're giving that um, springboard in a way or that, that initial foundation for people to start. Yeah. So were you approached to do the book? How, to, how did you feel about that? How did it come about? I, I had no intention of writing a book whatsoever. <laughs> but the publisher, Crowwood Press, sent me an email one December. And at first I thought, they don't mean they want me to write a whole book, no. Yeah. Maybe they want me to contribute a chapter or something. So I went back and said, is that what you mean? And she said, no, we want you to write a whole book. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Um, so I thought about it and I thought, actually, because my my career background before I was a painter was um, I was a editor on a dental journal. Very exciting. Um, so I had some experience in writing. And actually, when I did my degree, I opted to do an English dissertation and I did a creative writing one. Um, so I, I do enjoy writing. I always have done. So I thought maybe that's not such a bad idea, um, combining my love of writing with my love of painting. I didn't really know if I had enough to say. And I did say to the publisher, I was like, why me? And she said, looking at your Instagram post, you've got something to say. And I was like, okay. So she said, go away and put together a synopsis of what you think you might write about. And when I did, and I broke it down into chapters, I was like, actually, okay, let's do this. Um, and they initially wanted me to write the book in eight months. And I said, I'm, I'm going to need more time than that because I wanted this chapter on the seasons. And I wanted that to be substantial because I knew there was a lot to say around that. And so I had two years, which meant I got, yeah, two years to just watch the seasons flow from one into the next and document it properly. Um, and I think that was the right call because I would not have wanted to rush that chapter. No. Sort of try and think oh what was it like in spring I can't I can't remember mm -hmm. to, to be able to watch it live and record it and really think about it was important to me did you have a deadline in that sense or was it just yeah there was a deadline I mean they, they were very flexible they said you know if you're if you're struggling or if you know th things had to change a bit as well um because obviously I've got the chapter on painting light in the med and it was before COVID hit that I signed, you know, the contracts to write the book and stuff. And um, I had plans to go to Nice in France. Um, I was going to go to America um, and Greece. So I, I was going to paint lots of different locations. But in the end, those trips got cancelled. So I managed to get out to Greece last October. And the deadline for the book was December. So I, I wrote that chapter. It was one of the last ones I wrote. Um, but they, they were flexible. And um, as long as I kept them up to date with how things were sort of metamorphosizing in my head as I went, mm -hmm. they were fine as long as I, you know, stuck to the synopsis. I, th I think initially I had 10 chapters, but that shrunk down to eight because certain parts I realized once I started writing, they weren't big enough to warrant a chapter to themselves mm -hmm. and they could be tacked on somewhere else. Um, but, yeah, it was... It was it was a good experience. I enjoyed it. Not something I planned to do, like I said, but really glad I've done it. And the response has been, mm. I've been absolutely blown away by what people have said. And, you know, people are saying, you, yeah, I'm, I'm actually reading it. And I'm like, wow. Because I, I know from my experience, I love art books, but I'm also very guilty of sort of flicking through and looking at the pictures, yeah. really digesting what's inside. So I'm so thrilled and honoured that people are actually taking the time to read it. So oh, it reads really well. well. It's, yeah. I think it's one of those things. So you said about Richard Pikesley's book, and I've got that as well. And, yeah. um, you know, I think it, it's, and it's kind of what we wanted to do with this podcast a bit, is have things about people's colour palettes, routines, setups, and all of that kind of stuff. Because when... I used to look at art books, I'd go to WH Smith or whatever, and it would just be like these very basic books, you know, and it often just um, re-editions of quite yeah. old books with, with new images. But in an age of Instagram, social media and stuff like that, to actually see behind 
what you're painting because we see the images. Mm -hmm. It's all of these little bits of information, you know, yeah. just about the colours you mix in or how you approach this and some of those little sort of statements you've made about, you know, atmosphere. Like, to, to people who are just starting painting or, you know, even if they're professional painters, I think it's just such a such a worthwhile thing. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, even yeah. the, the detail of previously writing for a dental journal relating to writing a book. I mean, I had a bit of a connection there because before I started making art, I worked for a dental laboratory. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah so I kind of <laughs> was learning the kind of Fox's plane or is it Fox's campus? I can't remember the measurements on the face, like the yeah. vertical dimension and all things like that because yeah. I was interested in drawing portraiture and I wanted interesting measurements and because dentists are full of interesting measurements that we wouldn't know otherwise yeah. for how the teeth can sit comfortably and uh and things like that so I was learning bits and I was on the brink of painting the um the uh the, not the filling the crowns you know that to actually paint oh, yeah. did painting and they had little uh palette knives and people who mixed the colors and we were talking about different types of greys, warm and cool greys that would oh, yeah. the illusion of the light on the teeth. And it's really interesting. But I was actually just delivering the teeth to different dentists. So I'd sit in the um, offices, you know, drawing whilst they were processing what I delivered for them. So it was yeah. always had this artistic, you know, connection for me. Was there a, an artist in you whilst you were writing the the journals for, for dentistry was there some part of you there which had any kind of connection to it then? um well obviously I was painting alongside um yeah. I sold a few paintings to colleagues that I worked with really? all those years ago um I suppose as much as I enjoyed the writing I also really enjoyed the design side of the magazines mm. and um it's actually quite beneficial because I picked up skills to use like Adobe InDesign and Photoshop and stuff, which mm. comes in really handy now. Like if I need a catalog, I can design it myself or, you know, if I'm doing something for social media, I can just mock something up. Um, but I was very focused on the visual side of magazine layouts and making sure they were nicely composed and things like, I guess. So yeah, I think there was a, a sort of crossover but yeah I mean I suppose when I was sort of going down that road and just focusing on the writing and things that I think that would have been a, a, a good career path for me on its own um the art was always there and it always shouted louder so that's why it took over in the end but to be able to combine the two things is just mm. Mm. and if, I can't believe I didn't actually think about it yeah. I suppose I just thought, well, no one's going to be interested in what I've got to say because they just want to look at the painting. They don't care about the rest of it. But I think you're right. We, we all learn from each other, don't we? Absolutely. We want yeah. to know everyone's yeah. process and how they think about things. And, yeah, we're always the learning. Person, as well, the person behind the artwork is always of interest to me is to know little bits of details about who the person is is always going to intrigue people because if they engage with your work – that's an extension of who you are as a person anyway, isn't it? So yeah, I always find true. that a bit of an insight to uh, the personality behind the, the painting. Yeah, yeah. And it's the different layers, isn't it? With, like I was saying earlier, I mean, say Instagram, for example, which is, you know, so important nowadays that it's sort of one layer that people see the work and every now and then, no, I'll post something and see someone else and it's a real and see you working, painting, something like that. And there's all of these different layers. And, you know, I know just as I'm an artist, I'm a professional artist, but I'm also a fan of lots of artists. And I like to see those little things, just little yeah. glimpses. I was saying to Rod in the last episode, um, Rod Major would often you know, do these reels and he'd have his Pichard box there. And I'd be like, sort of trying to pause them to see what tubes of paint he had. There. Yeah. It's just those little things that have always excited me and, you know, want to want to know more. And now I get it off people. I get DMs and emails saying, 
you know, how did you mix that colour or and yeah. you know, it's, but I do the same to to other artists. So it's this it's this nice feedback. Um, yeah. So, so uh, talking about like so you've done a degree in communications, yeah, mm -hmm. and you have that background in um, magazine design and writing. I can definitely see all of that in your social media and your Instagram okay. and your branding and your website and stuff like that. And it's so important to see it in many ways to, to have it your front of house. It's your yeah. gallery. Um, how conscious are you of, you know, branding and designing and almost curating yourself in that sense? Yeah, I think um, more so now than ever. I suppose mm. initially it wasn't really a major concern, but I just, I suppose as I found my voice and I know what I'm about mm. and I know my style, I wanted to find um, like the font that matches me and would work sitting on a page, like a web page with my paintings. Um, and I'm just, you know, if I've got a newsletter going out and my website and as as far as I can take it on social media, I want them all to marry up together. So it's instant, instantly recognisable as, oh, that, yeah, that's Sarah's website. Oh, yeah, that's a post from Sarah. Uh, oh, yeah, th this is her newsletter. It's in my inbox and it's the same. Um yeah, and it, like you said, it's it's all multi-layered. It's all part of who we are. It's our identity, and it's important that that's uniform and it doesn't – I mean, obviously things change and develop over time, but you yeah. need to have an identity in all Absolutely. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it's – I mean, it's one of the aspects of being an artist today, um, of sort of being your own sort of brand design, your own marketing. Yeah, yeah everything. 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 Um, talking about that, do you, do you mainly sell your work for galleries? Do you sell it to private collectors online? Um, primarily direct to collectors online, I think. Yeah. I do work with galleries sometimes, but mm -hmm. um, I've had some successful shows that I've done myself and I'm, I'm happy to do that work that a gallery would do. Um, so... Yeah, but it all depends on the situation. I mean, I've got some shows, a show that starts tomorrow that's with a gallery in London, and um, yeah, I'm happy to do that. I think I just sort of assess yeah. each opportunity as it comes along. But I like to have, like, the last big show I did was with Georgina Potter. Mm. We 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 worked very well together as a team, yeah. and we to do a show together was just, it, it worked brilliantly. Um, and I think we probably do that again in the future. Um, but it just means that we've got 100% control and, yeah, between us, you know, I did the catalogue design, George organised stuff for the PV, we just sort of divvied up the jobs mm -hmm. and, and it worked. So, um, I mean, each to their own. It depends if an artist wants to do it themselves or not. If they're not mm -hmm. interested in doing it, then, you know, that's where the gallery earns their commission absolutely um but yeah yeah and it's these sort of hybrid so it's hybrid ways of working now mm. it's not tra traditional routes where it's you know looking for galleries looking for galleries you yeah. can do it yourself and i think once like you and georgina are very well established you know you you have that that sort of um uh, influence or you have a standing to create those things yourself and yeah. full creativity and control is in your hands and it's, it's fabulous yeah no it's yeah. um it's empowering that you that you know one can do it for yourself yeah you just you just have to put the put the work in yeah um, one of the things we like to do is make sure that people who are watching and listening know where they can find your work in order to okay. support you and purchase you and see your work. so And the, and the book as well. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So where is it you'd like people to go and support you and see your work? Okay, well, obviously, um, Instagram's a great place to start because I don't have all of my paintings on my website at one time. I have a selection of um, paintings on there. On Instagram, I tend to post most things that I paint. Um, and if they sell, I tend to mark them as sold. So that's a great way of seeing 
you know, my whole portfolio, I suppose. Um, the book, I am currently selling signed copies to UK customers only. And um, the reason it's just UK is because of the cost of shipping and then customs the other end. It, it just not doesn't make sense for buyers overseas to buy from me. Um, so, yeah, UK customers sign copies from me. You can also buy from Crowwood and um, the publisher. And if you are overseas and you want a copy, and for example, it's not going to be released in the States for another six months, but you can order from blackwells.co.uk and they are shipping all over the world. And I, somebody messaged me this morning to say that she'd received her copy in America. So um, that's amazing. Um, and yeah, that's 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 the other option. Um, yeah, and I've so got... Sorry, I was just going to say, aside from the online platforms, is there exhibitions you'd like to announce that you have coming? That, that would be lovely, if I may. Um, so I am in a four-man, four-person exhibition um, <laughs> called Four Strings at the Graham Hunter Gallery, 81 Baker Street, London. It launches tomorrow and it runs until the 28th of October. I've got 10 landscape paintings in there. And you can view my work on the Graham Hunter Gallery website. Um, I am also launching myself um, a collection of still life paintings. They are coming out, uh, I think it's Friday week. I think that's the date I picked. Um, so that's just on my website. And if people want to be notified when they go live, they can sign up to my newsletter on my website for that. And also, I'm a member of the British Plan Air Painters Group, and we have an exhibition called A Plan Air Vision. And that starts, sorry, so many dates, trying to get it straight mm. in my head. That starts on the 31st of October and runs to the 5th of November. And that is at the Royal Watercolour Society Gallery, just off Trafalgar Square in London. We have over 200 paintings. There are 27 members. If you're into Plan Air, and that's your thing. I recommend a visit because we've got some fabulous names exhibiting in that show. Um, and also the collection will be launched online closer to the time so people can see and buy that way. Fantastic. Well, you've been so generous with your time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so it's much. It's been such a pleasure talking to you guys. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much.